The Wreck of the Sea Venture. It sounds like an adventure, doesn't it? But this isn't Pirates of the Caribbean, huh. and it's not even uh, it's not even Robinson Crusoe or Swiss Family Robinson or Castaway. There are no volleyballs in this story. <laughs> but there is a shipwreck, and there is an island, and there are pirates, and there's treasure, and this is a true story. It started back in 1609 in the New World. Of course, we know perfectly well that the New World wasn't really new. It's as old as the Old World, but it was a New World to the people in the Old World. And so they came for adventure. Well, the pilgrims, they came for religious freedom and for space, and basically pretty altruistic and benign, although sometimes that kind of uh, lust. Yeah, you know, there were the witches and all that. But the people who came to Virginia, they didn't even pretend to be benign. They came for glory. They came for gold. You know, this famous gold mines in Virginia. They came for gold. They came for land. They came for power. And uh, it was entrepreneurial. There were venture capitalists involved. So the first people that they brought to, to Virginia, they just disappeared completely. Then the next people they brought that came to Virginia, nine out of 10 of them died. And at that point, the venture capitalists back in London, they said, you know, we should support those people or we're gonna just lose everybody. And that's why they got the supply caravans, the, the uh, ships. And so in 1609, the third supply convoy, there were nine ships that set out. The largest and most well-equipped of those was the Sea Venture, and it was captained by Sir Admiral George Summers. The man was a rising star, for sure. Had 150 men. Well, the nine ships set out in the middle of the Atlantic. They encountered a hurricane. Everybody was blown off course. Sooner or later, most of the ships did make it to Virginia, but not the Sea Venture. It began taking on water after the hurricane was over. They recently had it recocked, and I guess they didn't look up the Yelp reviews because the caulking failed. And so they began to sink lower and lower and lower, and finally it was only by bailing 24 hours a day that they kept the thing afloat at all. Luckily, they saw land, and they landed on the land. <laughs> they landed, actually, on the reef. Luckily, all 150 men survived, the ship didn't survive, it was wrecked. But where were they? Well, this is another luckily part. Bermuda. <laughs> oh, I know, we know Bermuda as a tropical island paradise, right? This is a resort destination, and it was pretty good back then, too. They had several things that were really going for them. For one thing, there were no indigenous people to, you know, kill them or anything, <laughs> and there were no previous immigrants to set up walls and tell them to go back where they'd come from. And they had hogs and game birds and lots of trees with coconuts and mangoes and bananas and things and, and uh, life was pretty good. In fact, when they got together and they said, we should just go on to Virginia, a lot of people said, why? It's <laughs> <laughs> good here. But Sir Admiral George Summers, he was a company man. He was contractually obligated to go to Virginia to deliver the supplies and so they soon started to build ships. How much we to be? They built two ships, the Patience and the Deliverance, out of things that they had salvaged from the Sea Venture and uh, cedar that was growing there on the island. And finally, 10 months later, they took off for Virginia, for Jamestown. All 100, well, no, not all 150, they left three men behind. And this is a good time for me to tell you that the star of this story, well, at least the main character of this story, is a man named Edward Waters. It seemed like a no-brainer to me. Deep waters, still waters, wouldn't this be the time to tell you about a sailor whose last name actually was Waters? <laughs> but why did he stay behind? There are a couple of versions of that story. One was that simply as a Summers man, because he figured that Summers was a rising star and he was going to rise on the coattails to fame and fortune. That Summers deliberately had him stay behind with a couple of other guys to sort of a placeholder. So that if anybody else landed in Virginia, they could just say, nothing to see here, move along. <laughs> but there's another story, and that is a little bit darker. Maybe, maybe Edward Waters killed someone. A and uh, so if he went to Virginia, he'd be likely brought up on charges of murder and likely to be hanged. So when the other people left for Virginia, he was conveniently not there on the dock. 
And interestingly enough, one of the things they did to, to uh, punish him was that they didn't just tie him up, they tied him to the body of the person that he'd killed. Interesting, right? Gives you a chance to think about what you've done, and it also makes you a little bit slower in moving. Anyway, he eventually, yeah, think about that next time. Well, he eventually got free, but he did stay behind. Just Waters and two other people. And they got along okay. They weren't building ships or anything. They were just kind of waiting. And this is where the treasure comes in. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking of a wooden chest filled with gold doubloons and jewels and things like that. No, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. It was an 80 pound lump of what was basically whale barf. <laughs> it was an ambergris, which is a flammable waxy substance that's produced in the digestive system of a whale. And I know that sounds disgusting, and I'll bet it looked disgusting too, but the thing is, back then, it was the fixative for perfume and very, very valuable. 80 pounds, that was worth about 2,400 British pounds sterling. So in essence, those three guys were instant millionaires. Did that cause a little bit of a problem? Well, yes it did. And at one point, Waters and one of the other guys just set a duel, you know, 50 paces at dawn. But the third guy thought, well, a duel isn't going to be good for any of us, so under cover of darkness, he just took all the likely uh, pistols and swords and daggers and hid them in the brush. And so the next morning when the guys woke up at dawn from the duel, well, there were no weapons, no weapons, no duel, friends again, yes. <laughs> and so it was that finally they did make it to Jamestown. It wasn't a good time to be in Jamestown. It was a 500-year drought. It was a starving time. People were eating their shoes and their belts and each other, but you know, they were determined to make a go of it. Oh, but I have to tell you, first, first when they were there, George, um, Admiral George Summers did make it back to establish his island paradise. He had the plans all drawn up for a deluxe resort condominium complex with <laughs> dolphin shows and snorkeling and things like that, but it didn't really work out that way because he'd only been back in Bermuda for two days when he died. People said that it was undercooked or uncooked fish, and the fact that they took the sushi off the menu at the local diner sort of corroborates that. But now Waters, his plan A wasn't working. The guy that he was going to ride his coattails, his coattails were now six feet under, so no coattails to ride. He was going to have to think of another plan. So when he went to Virginia, he got some land and began to build a house, and then it was that well, he wasn't quite finished with his dreams of adventure, but he didn't have any better luck the next time or the next or the next, because one day he set sail for the West Indies, but he got lost and ended up in the Canary Islands. And the next year he set sail for the West Indies and his ship sank and it was rescued. He was rescued from drowning by a passing, passing ship that happened to be filled with, yes, pirates who took him to England, and then the next year he decided to go back to Virginia, but he got lost, got completely turned around, and ended up back in Jamestown. Well, I guess he took that as a sign. And so he began to build a little extension on his house, and he acquired more and more land, and he got married. He married a woman named Grace O'Neill. Now, she was from Northern Ireland, from the Antrim coast. She was born in Dunluce Castle, which the ruins are still there. You can see them, and in fact, my husband and I did. One of the cool things about the Dunluce Castle was that one day the, the wing of the castle that had the kitchen just fell off into the ocean. So you can imagine that. The man of the castle comes back and says, where's my dinner? And says, oh, got your dinner and the kitchen fell into the ocean. Which is pretty epic for an excuse for my dinner, right? Well, in Virginia, the first settlers there were men. Of course, because, you know, men to kill things and, and treasure and, you know, men. But at some point they thought, you know, if we're going to make this a permanent settlement, we might need some women. So they advertised in England and Ireland, and they recruited 300 young single women who were willing to come to the New World uh, with the promise of an all-expense-paid cruise. And in fact, some of those all-expenses were, were worn by the actual individual settlers themselves, sort of a mail-order bride situation. But Grace Neal was not one of those. She was of aristocracy, she had her own money, she came of her own volition and on her own dime, well, on her own shilling. She came to see what she could find, and what she found was Edward Waters, and they were married, and things were looking pretty good for a while, and then there was the Great Indian Massacre of 1622. 
It started out mostly like it's sort of a uh, Thanksgiving thing with everybody eating turkey and passing the cranberry sauce and stuffing. And then apparently the natives had something planned for the after dinner entertainment. They just grabbed all the carving knives and all the serving spoons and anything else that looked like it could be a weapon and they killed 345 people. Well, the first report said that Grace and Edward were part of those, but in fact they weren't killed at all. They were just captive. But the Indians were so excited about the, the success of their massacre that they had a huge celebration. There was a big bonfire, there was singing, there was dancing, there was feasting, there was drinking, there was drinking, there was drinking, and nobody was watching the canoes. So when Grace and Edward noticed an unattended canoe, they made their escape. And that's the last of the excitement that I can tell you about in the life of Edward Waters. And he did show up in court from time to time. It was mostly things like, you know, uh, will probate or, or a boundary dispute or something like that. But at the age of 45, I guess he thought it was time to go back to England and check on his lands there in England and Ireland. And so he did go back and he wrote out his will. And I don't know if those two of those are connected, but then he died. And so he left, um, he made provision for his wife, Grace, for his daughter, Margaret, and he left all of his lands in England and Ireland and Jamestown to his son, William, everything to his son, William, except for all the tobacco in the basement of his house in uh, Elizabeth City, which he left to his friend, James Pennypacker of Cheapside. I don't know why. Well, I guess you're wondering, there, that's mostly the end of Edward Waters, and I, I don't know if you could say that he was deep. I think he was sort of a shallow thinker, really. But after he died and was buried, I'm pretty sure you could say that that Waters was definitely still. And a few more things that I want to tell you about him, as you probably guessed, Edward Waters was my great, 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 great grandfather. And one more thing that I should tell you is that back in England, there was a man, a writer, of some success and renown as a playwright and a poet. And he was coming to the end of his career, but he was looking to write a new play. He was looking for a topic that was on everybody's mind and in all the newspapers and everything. And he was looking for a, a setting and a plot and characters. And that's how Edward Waters and all the other sailors on the sea venture showed up in Shakespeare's The Tempest. Ah.